we are over in in East Kemptville, um, which is uh, right in the center of uh, Southwest Nova Scotia. So we're about equidistant between um, Shelburne on the South Shore side and Digby on the Fundy side uh, and Yarmouth at the very bottom of the province. So we're we're about as far away from the ocean as you can get. Um, and in a location that is extremely remote, uh, right up against the, uh, the Tobiatic Wilderness area. So uh, in this photograph, the other side of the river is actually the boundary of the Tobiatic, uh, which extends uh, you know, which is sort of our big vast backyard. Uh, and uh, we're set right on 125 acres of property right bounding on the uh, on the Tobiatic wilderness area uh, in a really unspoiled pristine wilderness environment. Um, and I'll keep coming back to those few points um, uh, over and over again. But um, when we talk about Trout Point Lodge, and um, we talk about what we do and what we represent and who we are, um, we spent quite a lot of time trying to distill a message in to um, something very clear and concise that we could uh, we could explain to anybody who's asking, and it always amazes me uh, at how many um, businesses or or or, or you know uh, other entities uh, have trouble with that. You know, you some people call it an elevator pitch, or some people call it sort of an identity statement. But um, we um, we always come back to three things, and uh, uh, I'll mention them now, and this will come back again and again in uh, in uh, over the next few minutes as we uh, as we go through. Um, but the first thing is the uh, is the luxury side of things. So we are five star, uh, really really well appointed rooms. Um, uh, we're uh, we're at a pretty high price point uh, within the Nova Scotia market, and of course, being there, there are very high expectations, uh, very uh, legitimate high expectations uh, from our guests. So um, the luxury, the amenities, all of the comforts of a five-star place is, uh, uh, is, is one of the er uh, elements that we really focus on quite a lot. Um, the second one is the culinary program. So we, um, we have a very small culinary team here that does amazing things with menus that change every single day. Uh, so we don't, have a, uh, we don't have a set menu. You won't find fish and chips and burgers on the menu you here. Um, our culinary team really has an opportunity and uh, and the talent to uh, to just display their creativity on a daily basis with a menu that changes every single day. Uh, and we focus a lot on what we call hyper local cuisine. Um, most of which is procured right from our own backyard here. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. Um, just a shameless plug here too. We have a, a wine list that's won Wine Spectator Award of Excellence for 12 years in a row uh, and is probably uh, uh, up there with anything that you would find in much larger you know, operations or cities around, uh, around the world. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, and uh, the third thing and probably most relevant to our discussion today uh, is the outdoor experiences. So um, when, when, uh, when guests come here, we are really at our happiest uh, when we are able to um, curate and introduce them to this amazing natural environment that we call home and we're so lucky to call home. Uh, and many of our guests, of course, pre-COVID came from all over the world. Um, in the last two years, uh, our guests have been 99% Nova Scotians uh, and we've never been busier, which is a wonderful thing. But uh, most of our guests live in cities or in environments where uh, natural pristine wilderness is really not a uh, not uh, something that's available to them, uh, no matter, you know, no matter how much wealth you have, no matter where you live, um, this pristine natural environment is something that we, uh, uh, that we're blessed with, uh, and we really like to share with our, uh, with our guests. So we are, uh, we are very happy when uh, those three things, the luxury, the culinary and the wilderness experience come together. Uh, and we'd like to think that um, uh, there are maybe other places around that do one of these things, maybe do two, but we, uh, we don't believe there's anybody out there that does three of them the way that we do uh, and of course the uh, you know the uh, the validation of that really is in our guest feedback and our uh, our guest uh, our guest uh, commentary and their satisfaction and uh, um, you know uh, we've uh, we've really been going from strength to strength even during COVID uh, with all of uh, with all of the local guests just uh, supporting us and uh, uh, and coming back for multiple visits a season and word of mouth and all that so we're uh, we're kind of firing on all cylinders at the moment which uh, which we're very proud about so um, I thought I would take a second or two just to explain a little bit also about the uh, the history of Trout Point Lodge. Um, so uh, the Tobiatic Wilderness Area was um, was set up in the early 1970s, and before that, there were a number of little camps and uh, and uh, small little establishments out here, um, but nothing like like Trout Point Lodge. So um, the lodge was um, uh, construction started in 1999, and the lodge opened in 2000. Uh, the original owners were two gentlemen from the U.S., uh, one of whom was 
was from uh, Louisiana who had kind of Cajun Acadian roots, which is what brought him back to Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, they were the kind of the visionaries who built the property uh, and who got the lodge started from uh, from pretty much a standing start back in the year 2000. Um, and my wife Pam and I uh, came here as guests in 2017. Uh, we were living uh, not too far away in Montreal and uh, had been to Nova Scotia many, many times. But like like so many visitors, we had never uh, explored the southwest side of the province we had done you know Cape Breton and Halifax and all those popular spots uh, so we expected it to be nothing more than kind of a nice long weekend getaway in a, in a part of the province we had never visited before uh, and of course turned out to be uh, to be a whole lot more than that which we're thrilled about so uh, Pam and I took over in um, in 2018 and we are just coming into our fourth full season here um, and uh, despite obviously the uh, the the challenges of COVID uh, that have pretty much touched every single person on the planet um, we're um, we're doing very, very well, and, and just uh, so thankful and uh, and uh, and pleased about uh, about being able to run even with the borders closed. So uh, we have uh, we have had pretty much 100% Atlantic bubble guests uh, for the last two years until the last couple of weeks, um, where uh, the outside world has started to come back in. And of course, today's big announcement with uh, uh, with uh, proof of vaccination uh, required um, on check in is uh, uh, I guess reassured us even more that we're uh, you know that we're on the right track and things are moving forward forward to uh to post covid whenever that might be um but we've kind of come through this turbulence really uh, really pretty well so uh, just in terms of the size of the business, we have um, we have three buildings on property. We have the main lodge, which uh, which I'll show you in some detail in a second. Uh, we have a second building called Beaver Hall, and I'm actually in Beaver Hall right now uh, in one of our guest suites um, doing this presentation. Uh, and then we do have one cottage on the other side. So, so a total of 13 rooms. Uh, so we're very small, very, um, very intimate. Um, we are full at about 26, maybe maximum 30 guests. Um, so it's not a huge operation here. Um, we're really not, uh, uh, you know, we're not a volume shop. We don't get tour buses in or anything like that. Um, and for, for 13 rooms um, in the peak of our season, uh, we have about 33 employees on, uh, on, uh, on, um, on site at any given time or in the team at any given time. So our employee to guest ratio is actually higher than one to one, uh, which is usually a recipe for um, financial suicide. But uh, uh, in our case here, being so far out of the way um, and, you know, sort of having these really high standards, um, it's just a necessity. And uh, we're we're really, really pleased uh, about the team that we've assembled. And uh, uh, I will spend a little bit more time on that in terms of recruitment and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the type of people that we uh, that we uh, that we really look for and really thrive in our environment. But uh, um, uh, if I were to simplify even more than that, I would say the business that we're in right now is very, very easy to understand. Um, it's not complicated. It's very operationally um, heavy, uh, but uh, it all comes down to the people and the teammates that we have here. It's really that simple. Uh, and if we can assemble the best team of uh, experienced, keen, enthusiastic, you know, guest centric um, uh, team members, um, that's where everything else is possible. Uh, if we can't do that, then then we'll struggle with doing anything else at all. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, about uh, just about 32, 33 employees in the, in the peak of the season. Um, in the quieter months, that that goes down, obviously. But uh, we are very uh, uh, very guest centric and very uh, and very employee uh, employee heavy in a way that you're not likely to see in a large urban hotel. Um, and in terms of our future direction. Um, we are uh, pretty excited. This will be coming out very shortly uh, on social media and on our own website, but we will be um, opening up for the winter this year for the first time ever. Um, so one of the benefits, I think, uh, of, uh, of having so many local visitors over the last little while uh, has been, um, uh, has been uh, you know, lots and lots of inquiries and lots of questions about whether we open in the winter. And, uh, uh, and Pam, my wife and I, who are, you know, we're the owners here, we, uh, um, you know, we always try to gather guest feedback and really reflect um, carefully on it um, and uh, it got us thinking uh, with so few winter or shoulder season options in Nova Scotia, uh, why couldn't we make a good go of this? And uh, there's so much to offer in the winter months um, that uh, that we think we can really, uh, really do well by that. And uh, uh, so that will be announced very shortly. So you're getting a little bit of a sneak peek of that. Um, and the real reason for doing that other than the opportunity in the winter is really to, uh, to be able to, uh, you know, to offer our team members sort of close to year round employment. Um, the seasonality 
quality of the business here, and I think in Nova Scotia in general, um, presents a whole lot of challenges. Uh, and we're very, very keen to break that mold and get out of the seasonality and say we can assemble a team here who, uh, who, uh, who will be with us for longer than a season. It won't just be a gig before you go on to something else. Uh, it can be a career, and you can spend you know a few years here, uh, really learning and developing and kind of mastering the uh, you know the the job uh, in a way that benefits, of course, our guests and of course us. But I think we hope also our team members uh, as well. So that's the uh, that's the uh, the exciting news. Um, I thought we would maybe uh, keep going through the presentation and uh, and spend a little bit of time um, on uh, on uh, each of these um, these uh, uh, areas as far as it pertains to sustainability. So um, we uh, I'll just go briefly through all this and uh, uh, and talk a little bit about how sustainability kind of permeates all of those uh, those pillars of uh, of our proposition that I just mentioned: the luxury, the culinary, and also the wilderness experiences. Uh, and then spend a little bit of time talking about what we do here uh, from a sustainability perspective and also what we plan to do and what we th see the future as uh, from, a, from a sustainability perspective as well. So uh, just to orient you here, you are looking at a drone shot of our main lodge, uh, which is the uh, the green, uh, pretty much the only building there, uh, the green building in the bottom right corner, um, the bank uh, right on the banks of the Tusket River with the Tobiatic Wilderness area being on the other side. So uh, even this very, very uh, sort of limited view just shows you uh, the vastness of our uh, of our wilderness uh, home uh, and uh, and where we're situated. So it's a, it's a really wonderful spot. Uh, the uh, the river, uh, the Tusket River probably probably goes up and down about four feet per year. Um, so you're looking at it in a uh, uh, in, the, in the summer months. But uh, if you come, if you look at that in the, in the spring or the fall, you'll see the river vastly expanded from where that is. Um, but just gives you an idea about uh, sort of where we're where we're situated. Um, and I won't spend too much time on this, but here's a here's a shot of one of our uh, one of our guest suites. Uh, so we've got uh, all of our guest suites are handmade furniture. Um, logs are all white spruce from New Brunswick. Um, we have tried as much as possible. This is not done necessarily with sustainability in mind, but more for the experience. Um, our our view of uh, a guest experience in one of our suites. Uh, we don't want any electronics in there. We don't have TVs in the rooms. We don't have telephones in the rooms. Uh, we really uh, we really focus on on uh, on uh, high end appointed luxury uh, and no distractions of the outside world, which I think really fits in very well with you know our whole kind of you know way of doing things here. Uh, so you'll notice in that picture that you won't see uh, you know you won't see a uh, uh, an iPad in there. You won't see a flat screen TV on the wall. Uh, you won't see a telephone with a hundred buttons on the uh, on the the bedside table. Um, but it's all uh, it's all handmade, uh, um, uh, really high end appointed stuff. Um, the uh, uh, fireplaces are all uh, uh, locally quarried granite, all hand done, uh, and literally every single inch of this room and every other room here has been touched by somebody's hands at some point in time. Uh, and it's really, it's really amazing to think of the number of uh, person hours that must have gone into uh, into building this lodge and uh, and getting it in the way it is. Um, and the uh, the log structure, which I'll talk about a little bit more later, um, is a uh, is not only an architectural masterpiece, but is also um, some Something that requires surprisingly very, very little um, uh, upkeep and uh, and uh, uh, and maintenance on our part. So there's a few uh, really important things that we need to do, uh, and a few things we need not to do. Uh, but uh, um, the uh, the lifespan of this building with the with the log construction is is basically infinite as long as we take good care of it. So uh, it's really something uh, something special. So the room that you're looking at here is one of our one of our fireplace junior suites in the main lodge, uh, and you can already see some of those uh, those features. Um, uh, from uh, you know, in terms of the uh, the wood construction, the uh, uh, the hand chiseled fireplaces, and uh, uh, the overall theme that we're trying to get to, which is relaxation, removing distractions of the modern world, and really uh, and really just giving our guests a space to uh, to unwind and relax, whether they be there with their partner or their family members or friends or anything like that. Um, the second pillar is um, uh, our cuisine and our wine program, as I mentioned, uh, we we love the term hyper local. And I think it applies really well here um, in that uh, we try, uh, as I mentioned, we have a um, uh, a daily changing menu. So uh, if guests are here for a night or for a week, they never eat the same thing twice. Uh, and we really focus on what we call hyper local cuisine. Uh, so some aspects of what you uh, of what you eat when you come here are actually grown on site in our small gardens. Um, and we work with probably a couple of dozen uh, different local 
Uh, and uh, we absolutely uh, love doing that. And uh, of course, when you're talking about sustainability, um, there's uh, there's the very visible part of things, uh, you know, the things that people see when they walk through the door and, you know, whether they're, um, you know, how we do our recycling and how we do our composting and how we reuse things where possible. Um, but there's a lot of back end stuff that people don't see, but is, is probably equally important. And the, the real benefit of, uh, of these local partnerships, I think for us is um, probably three things. So one, of course, it's, uh, um, you know, these partners have uh, have become very integral members of our of our success as well. Um, uh, on our menus, we feature their names very, very prominently. So we buy, uh, we buy a lot of beef from a place called Richmond Highland Farms, which is just around the corner, and we love to highlight them. Uh, and uh, we get a lot of our produce from a place called St. Isidore Farms, which is about 15 minutes away. That's uh, about the closest neighbor that we have, really. Uh, and, uh, and we love to highlight where we get things from. We do the same thing with our seed food uh, and the same thing with uh, with as much of our produce as we can. Uh, so there's that big benefit. Um, the second benefit is really when you look at uh, when you look at uh, uh, food costs and procurement of, uh, of, uh, of supplies and things um, from a sustainability perspective, um, buying things locally um, cuts out so much of the supply chain, uh, which is where a lot of the, um, you know, the, the negative sustainability features kind of creep into uh, into things, even though they're out of view of guests. So um, if you're buying uh, if you're buying from large food service uh, operations and we do a little bit of that, not a lot. But if you're buying from large food service operations, um, it's very likely that the uh, the produce that you purchase has been on a very long trip around the world, um, burning a whole lot of hydrocarbons along the way and a whole lot of cold storage along the way and everything, um, which is all, of course, um, you know, a bit of a detriment to sustainability uh, in, in, in the larger sense. Um, so we're really pleased when we can uh, when we can get those local partnerships up and going. Um, and uh, and those partners have really become kind of friends of ours uh, and uh, and and partners in our success as well. So uh, all of that falls under the banner of what we call hyper local. Uh, and that sort of is what uh, is what defines our, uh, you know, our, our culinary program here as well. And then the third and probably most relevant thing uh, for us to talk to uh, about today is the unique wilderness experiences. So we um, we are blessed to live in this really pristine, untouched wilderness environment. Uh, and the first two things I talked about, luxury, luxury and culinary, um, are things that a lot of places attempt to do for sure. Um, and I think the one uh, the one unique factor, I think the one unique thing that uh, that Trail Point Lodge has, which is very rare, by, you know, uh, in in terms of uh, in terms of other locations is that just this amazing outdoor, um, you know, sort of a, a neighborhood that we live in here. Uh, and we have lots of guests who come from, from big cities and uh, uh, we, are, we are at our happiest when we can get um, our guests to go out and have the, these types of wilderness experiences, either guided or unguided. Uh, and for example, you know, here's two guests uh, kayaking. This is only about three minutes away from the lodge, but it feels like you're completely alone in the world. Uh, and how often does that ever happen, right? You could live your whole life if you're from a big city uh, without ever really being alone in the world and having that experience of just just connecting with nature and with with one another uh, in the absence of all other people uh, and we really feel that that's just a uh, just such a unique um, piece of our proposition here uh, and really the one thing that I think um, doesn't exist in too many other places uh, so when we when we look at how we curate these experiences and we look at how we um, you know how we use our natural environment to sort of enhance the uh, the, the stay here. Um, probably nine times out of 10, we actually decide not to do something. Um, you know, you'll never find a swimming pool or a basketball court here or, uh, you know, paved roads or anything like that, because anything we do to, uh, to take away from the beauty of this wilderness environment will ultimately be negative for us, for sure. Um, and uh, we, we try to be very explicit about that on our website. It, uh, you know, it says uh, we don't have cell phone service out here. Um, you know, we don't have TVs and rooms. Um, as in much more polite language, we, we try to say, if you're, you know, if you come, if you want to come here and watch Netflix, it's probably not the right place for you. Uh, there are many, many places that you can do that. And this is just not one of them. Um, so these unique experiences are, uh, are really front and center. Uh, and we have uh, made a lot of, uh, I'd like to think positive strides in terms of, uh, in terms of, of providing different curated experiences in different seasons. So we have two guides on staff um, who are real expert naturalists and they do, uh, they do things like meditation and forest bathing and nature walks and bird watching and of course stargazing which I'll touch on in a little while um, but we really try to curate these natural experiences and I think the uh, the opportunities are 
are completely boundless and endless, right? We just, uh, uh, it's really up to our imagination to see how we, uh, uh, how we uh, curate these, these, uh, these natural experiences um, in a way that, uh, that, that really resonates with guests. Um, and here's just a quick shot. This is a, another shameless plug. We're, uh, we're actually the first Starlight, uh, the world's first Starlight Hotel, and that has a very specific designation. Uh, it's a UNESCO designation, and uh, Trout Point Lodge was the very first hotel in the world to receive that. Uh, so we sit under some of the darkest skies in North America here. Um, following Trout Point Lodge's uh, designation um, from UNESCO, um, that, was, uh, that was later on expanded to become the, the uh, Southwest Nova Biosphere, which, uh, which many of you probably we know. Um, so we're the first, uh, the world's first Starlight um, uh, Hotel. Uh, the picture that you're looking at here uh, is a view from our Starlight, our stargazing platform, which is just about a three minute walk from the main lodge. Uh, and uh, the um, we go out every single night with our guests. We have an astronomer on staff here uh, that goes out every night as long as the weather cooperates and uh, uh, brings the uh, the heavens into view. So it's pretty impressive. You can see the Milky Way uh, going all the way down to the tree line, you know, uh, in almost a panoramic 360 degree view. Uh, so it's really impressive. Uh, and we like to kind of joke and say if uh, um, if our guests come here and have all this uh, uh, this luxurious amenities and amazing cuisine. And and uh, and wonderful wilderness opportunities and the wilderness experiences, and then later at night they come, uh, they go out at night and see the vastness of the uh, of the universe unfold right in front of them. Uh, if that's not good enough, then uh, then I'm, I'm not sure we can help you any more than that. But it's uh, it's been a really uh, uh, a really good combination, and uh, I just wanted to to give you a, a bit of a sense, at least uh, photographically, of uh, of the skies that we sit under, which uh, uh, which are really amazing any time of year. So um, getting to the sustainability piece of things, I, uh, uh, I hope those first few slides kind of have helped to provide a little bit of, let's say, wide context in terms of who we are and, uh, and what we do. Um, and now I'd like to turn my, uh, my uh, um, uh, uh, sort of turn all of our attention to, um, to sustainability and how, that, uh, and how that permeates what we do. Uh, and we, we didn't, uh, we, we don't put sustainability in a separate bucket of, um, you know, things we do. Uh, we really look at sustainability as something that permeates everything that we do. Uh, so it's not an afterthought, but it is really a guiding principle. And uh, as I said uh, a little earlier, um, sometimes we we make decisions not to do things um, uh, because uh, of the potential uh, impact on our, on our environment from a sustainability perspective. Uh, and I'll get into a few examples uh, of that too. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that from a culinary perspective, from a programming or guest experience pr perspective. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the design features of the uh, of the lodge and some of the things that are um, that have sustainability kind of built right in there, uh, and then also talk about what that means in terms of uh, in terms of recruitment and in terms of trying to uh, you know to assemble the uh, you know the best team in the business out here um, because sustainability does have an important part to, to play uh, in our uh, in our recruitment efforts as well. Um, so as I mentioned, from a from a culinary perspective, the local partnerships are huge. Uh, that that uh, that typically increases the quality of the product on the plate, which is super important. Uh, and very importantly, it really reduces the carbon footprint of our procurement from a culinary perspective. The more we can buy locally, uh, the better it is, right? Uh, for the reasons I mentioned before. Um, the, the seasonal focus is also uh, an area where um, uh, where there's a whole lot of sustainability built into that simple little phrase. Uh, so we do have uh, our menu follows the seasons and follows the uh, you know the produce available in this region uh, as the uh, as the uh, the summer turns into fall. Um, and uh, what that allows us to do uh, is really focus on on procuring things locally um, rather than going out and trying to find things that are not in season and all of the expense and all of the carbon footprint associated with that. So. Uh, with our farmer partners, uh, we uh, we really follow their lead in some ways more than they follow ours. Uh, and with our key partners, uh, you know the ones that we really do quite a fair bit with, uh, we we try to sit down with them on a regular basis and figure out um, how we can uh, how we can adjust and uh, and uh, and uh, um, sort of interpret their cuisine by our menus based on the season. So uh, it it adds a whole lot of efficiency to our to our farmer partners um, uh, operations, and it allows us to plan plan uh, for sort of our menu changes from summer to fall to winter uh, with a real focus on seasonality and being able to procure as much as uh, as much as possible uh, locally. Um, 
we do have uh, small on-premise gardens, uh, and um, that's mostly, uh, so we do a lot of microgreens, we do a lot of herbs, we do a lot of fresh stuff, uh, some veggies there too. Um, it's not on a scale that will, uh, that, that would be able to, uh, uh, to, to make us completely self-sufficient. Um, and in order to do that, we would just have to expand our, our gardens uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, in, in a way that would probably be a, to the detriment of our overall environment here in some way. Uh, so we do have, uh, we do have um, modest on, on-site gardens uh, uh, and uh, part of one of our wilderness experiences actually focuses on uh, on uh, on bringing guests through our our, uh, our gardens and, uh, and showing them sort of what we do here as well uh, and then the last thing creative purchasing um, we have a, we have a lot of our particularly our farmer part uh, partners here um, and uh, you know it's a it's a it's not an easy life being a farmer and uh, you you're, you're growing what you grow and sometimes uh, what you grow and what the market demands is not always the same uh, and sometimes there is a uh, there's an opportunity for us to work with them and say if you have uh, if you have excess of something or if you're anticipating that your season is going to be slower um, with particular products let us know and we can work them into the menu um, so it's kind of up and down the supply chain because I think the sustainability side uh, of what we do uh, doesn't begin and end at our front door at all I think uh, I think it really goes uh, it goes uh, really across the whole entire supply chain and um, we love having those conversations with our farmers because it's a huge benefit for them uh, it's a huge benefit Benefit for us, uh, and when we when we can tailor our menu around the availability of certain products that uh, uh, that our farmers uh, our farmer par uh, partners have, uh, then we uh, then we really you know we feel like we're on the right track from a sustainability perspective. Uh, the benefits are not always with us, but they are with others as well, uh, and um, and that's important too. Um, so from the programming side of things, um, we talked a little bit about the natural experiences and what uh, and, uh, and what we try to do with our guests as well. Uh, and uh, that direct interaction with our natural surroundings, uh, I think, has has a few really interesting um, sort of um, uh, benefits to it. Of course, there's the experience itself. Uh, and I mentioned that before, so I won't go I won't go back on that in, uh, in great detail. Um, but I think these curated and guided activities out in nature, uh, I think also really do build an awareness around uh, around Around some of the key issues that we deal with. Uh, and one of them, for example, this is very pertinent to what we do, um, is the issue of water conservation. Um, so you know, or many of you have probably heard that down in southwest Nova Scotia, but not so much this year, but in previous years, uh, there have been, um, you know, issues of water availability and water shortages and things like that. Uh, and uh, getting getting our, our, um, our guests out into nature and, and bringing that awareness to some of these key issues, whether it be water, you know, water or deforestation, uh, or erosion of the uh, the riverbanks uh, or any of those kinds of things uh, really does build an awareness and I think uh, many people kind of are, are learn better by doing and by seeing rather than by hearing about it um, so we really take that quite seriously and I think we, we try to of course not only build awareness you know uh, among our team members and among among ourselves, but also among our guests too. Um, and uh, um, we uh, we do theme our activities around our surroundings. So we uh, we try as much as possible with all of our um, programming and all of our guided activities uh, to, uh, in some ways, kind of let the nature do the work for us, right? So we um, we don't try to do things that are not uh, that are not. Um, sort of relevant to our environment. Um, and, uh, and we have always, uh, every single year, we're always able to come up with new and interesting, um, interesting um, uh, outdoor activities that are kind of highlighted by, by the place that we live in here. Uh, and more of that to come. So it's kind of a, a real endless opportunity uh, to, uh, to explore different aspects of our wilderness uh, and to do it in a way that our guests are uh, are hopefully enlightened and hopefully learn something and hopefully kind of you know uh, raise their awareness of these uh, of these key issues as well. Um, so that's kind of what we uh, what we look at doing from a programming perspective. And um, when you when you think about it really um, in a different kind of way, um, we uh, the the outdoor experiences and, and and introducing our guests to this type of uh, to these type of wilderness experiences um, actually has an amazing return on investment, even though we don't always think about things like that, um, because it's such a unique thing that they can't really do anywhere else. Uh, and the the impact and the benefit to our uh, to our guests is really huge, much more than if we were to drop $50,000 a room into renovating bathrooms, for example. Uh, and I'm, I just use that as, as an example. But when you think about um, the wilderness opportunities and the wilderness experiences from an ROI or a financial perspective, um, they're very, very compelling, um, in addition to being very compelling for their own sake. Um, so it's really kind of a win-win on that side with the uh, with the natural um, uh, outdoor experiences and something that we will really keep up for sure going uh, going forward. 
So uh, this is a view of the back of the main lodge. Um, and if any one of you have been to uh, been to our website, you've probably seen this picture already. But uh, um, the uh, some of the, the sort of sustainability, um, the built in sustainability features of the uh, uh, of the lodge are really interesting. Um, the first one to notice uh, that looks like one big building, but it's actually kind of three buildings put into one. Um, we have two natural breezeways that go um, that go through the building from front to back uh, and the log constructed part of it is actually three buildings in one with these two breezeways separated uh, and that does a number of things so one it allowed uh, the building to be constructed with logs that were easy, more easy to transport and from from a closer distance um, Two, there are some very important fire prevention and safety elements there. So, um, God forbid, one uh, one part of the hotel catches fire and burns to the ground, it won't necessarily bring down the other two parts, even though we don't like thinking about that. Um, and third of all, it, it kind of has uh, uh, has uh, provided the lodge with sort of natural heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, so we do have heating indoors for the uh, the fall and the winter. Uh, we do not have air conditioners. Um, one because we don't need them, uh, and two because the idea of having Having you know sort of compressors and uh, uh, and air conditioning ducts running running around the lodges is, is is very unappealing to us. So uh, there's kind of a natural airflow that comes through things, and uh, in all but the absolute hottest days of summer, uh, we don't even need fans in rooms. So it's really a, uh, it's really um, uh, kind of provides this natural air conditioning as a function of the design of the building. Um, another thing you'll notice, and uh, this was not obvious to me when I first looked at uh, this or when we first got here, but um, all of our uh, uh, all of our um, second floor and, and ground floor um, uh, outdoor areas have got very large overhanging eaves, um, almost like uh, like overhanging kind of canopies. Uh, and that's uh, that's very nice in and of itself. But the uh, the architectural reason for that is uh, to keep any weather and any water off of the uh, off of the structure itself. So um, the um, uh, the logs don't do well uh, if they are if they are exposed to the elements on a regular basis, particularly rain. Uh, so that architectural feature of having those kind of oversized eaves and, and hangovers uh, or over hangs, I guess I should say, um, is uh, is designed uh, to extend the life of the building and to uh, and to and to to keep the uh, the elements off of the building as well. Um, and then from a grounds perspective, we take a very, very light touch outside. So we do a little bit of curation uh, of the immediate grounds around with the uh, the flower beds and uh, and some features on the other side as well. Um, but we really try to uh, we try to get nature as close to the lodge as possible without it looking messy. Uh, so we do have a few boardwalks that go through the forest, and that really helps uh, one to minimize the impact on the uh, on the, the the forest floor itself. Uh, two, there's obviously a safety factor there with with guests going through the forest. So we do have a couple of boardwalks there too. Um, but really designed to get nature to come as close to the lodge as, as possible um, within, uh, you know, within within the environment that we're in. So you won't see manicured lawns here. You won't, it won't look like you're in Versailles with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very pristine cut uh, flower beds and all that sort of stuff. We like to, uh, uh, we like to take a light touch and try to make that fit in with our surroundings as much as possible. Um, and then finally, um, with respect to recruitment and uh, and uh, uh, and putting together a team of uh, of wonderful people that we uh, that we have here, and we're always looking to add to. Um, uh, I mentioned it earlier, but uh, I, I think I could I could sum up the uh, the key success factors of this business really into one thing. We we do a lot of things every day. Uh, of course, we have you know we have guests with special uh, with special uh, uh, requests, and we have uh, you know uh, three dinner three uh, meal services every day, and we've got uh, we've got lots of moving pieces going on but um, if I had to sum up our success uh, our key success factors in one word it would be people uh, it is that simple uh, that if we have the the best and most capable most enthusiastic um, and passionate people in the team uh, there is just nothing that we can't do uh, and we've been very very blessed I think to have a, to have a wonderful team of people that have been with us for quite some time we have over a hundred years of experience in the team um, but we're always looking to uh, looking to bring new and talented and uh, uh, and energetic members of the team here and sustainability um, is is built right into the culture and I think uh, when uh, when people are looking at uh, at deploying their skills and uh, and uh, and uh, and working for a particular business, uh, whether it be hospitality or anything else, um, I think more and more um, the cause and the why is just as important as the what. Uh, so the sustainability um, uh, piece of the business really does help us to recruit in the sense that uh, it kind of becomes a common cause and purpose for our team. Um, one of the things that we will be doing in the, in the next year as well as a new initiative is doing some uh, some corporate social responsibility uh, with 
with the team um, uh, with um, focused on on sustainability and environmental causes as well. So we uh, we not only say it, but we also put our money where our mouth is and uh, uh, and really do that. But that sustainability um, uh, sort of piece that kind of weaves itself through everything that we do uh, has has uh, has been very beneficial in terms of helping um, you know helping us to recruit people that share our beliefs that really you know, that really kind of buy into the uh, you know the uh, the way that we do things out here. Uh, and ultimately, it does become a uh, you know a recruitment benefit as well in terms of helping to attract the uh, you know the best talent and uh, and giving everybody a bit of an idea as to why we're here and the cause that we support and uh, uh, and the reason for getting out of bed every morning. Right? It's not just about uh, about running a hotel, right? Because you can do that anywhere you like. Uh, but it's really about uh, it's really about making a difference. And uh, uh, and I think our team members have uh, uh, you know have really uh, that's really resonated with the team from a recruitment perspective as well. So with respect to what the future of, of sustainability from our perspective uh, looks like, um, there's really a few things. I think, uh, um, I think it's just keeping on raising the standards in terms of what we're doing and, uh, and uh, the three or four vectors that I talked about in terms of uh, local partnerships and, uh, uh, and natural experiences and all that and others. Um, there's always more we can do in terms of uh, just trying to, trying to e even more deeply kind of permeate sustainability into everything that we do. So um, that's really keeping on doing what we uh, what we're already doing, uh, we'd like to think pretty well. Um, the second one is to, to make sure that sustainability is a uh, is a metric in all the areas that we work in. So it's not just about, um, you know, sort of uh, thinking about it in its own respect. Uh, it's also about trying to figure uh, uh, to, to, to weave sustainability into, uh, you know, into all of our decision making, uh, even more than we do today. And that might be uh, in terms of products that we use for housekeeping, it might be, it might, uh, be um, you know, in terms of opportunity to use alternative energy sources. Um, we, uh, we are expanding our electric vehicle um, uh, charging stations from one to two uh, next year. And uh, I have no doubt that electric vehicles are the way of the future. And uh, uh, two will be enough maybe for a little while, but not for long. And we're, uh, we're uh, gonna be a leader there. I think we were one of the first already in Nova Scotia to get a uh, uh, EV charging ports. Uh, and we're really excited about that. And that's a, kind of a way for us to very, very, um, um, very overtly demonstrate our commitment to, uh, to sustain sustainability uh, and then look for other you know additional opportunities to lead and uh, um, you know it might be ways for us to uh, you know to work more closely with uh, with government as far as protection of the Toby attic goes which is our big backyard which doesn't belong to us it belongs to all of us um, and ways to uh, and ways to really lead in that uh, in that respect we've looked uh, we've looked a little bit at uh, you know alternative energy be it solar or wind and, and things like that and uh, uh, and are very keen to uh, you know to explore those possibilities as well um, but that's what we think uh, um, you know, sustainability will look like here at Trout Point Lodge as we uh, as we move forward. Um, so with that, I hope I'm more or less keeping to time. I've tried to. Uh, so it's just 9:45, but uh, just wanted to uh, to leave everybody with uh, with a couple of uh, points of contact. Um, I can't resist a shameless plug uh, in a in a captive audience. So forgive me for this, but our website is right there. And uh, um, if if there are any questions that uh, uh, that we don't get to today for any reason, um, you can of course send them through uh, through your own department. But uh, we're just at info at troutpoint.com uh, as well. So um, I hope you found that beneficial, and I will pause for breath right now and uh and caitlin maybe see uh turn back uh, back over to you hi thank you so much that was so informative and it looks so beautiful and we actually did get a lot of questions from students so that was that was really nice as well um i uh Right now, we do have some that I have ahead of time, which I will ask you, and then maybe I'll ask the questions that we got throughout the presentation. So let mm -hmm. me just grab those. Okay, so how has COVID-19 impacted the Trout Point Lodge? I know you mentioned well, um, beginning some things, but... Yeah, I, um, you know, like everybody, I suppose, when COVID came to town for real, uh, we uh, we were concerned and uncertain as to what that would mean to us, and uh, um, you know we always take the uh, take the uh, approach out here that uh, there's a whole lot of things in life that you can't control, and all you can really do is just control your uh, you know what you do every day, and you know when you get out of bed every morning kind of thing. So we were quite determined to uh, to soldier on as long as we could with COVID uh, in in the you know in the context of that serious uncertainty that we had, uh, you know, kind of at the beginning of 2020, I suppose. Um, so we're we're 
we're very lucky uh, here uh, that because of our very low density of, of guests, as far as the size of our property goes, so we have about 26 guests in a full house on 125 acres of property. Um, social distancing and all that has never been much of a problem here. So we had a really built in advantage compared to other places. Um, if you think of a, an urban hotel where you've got, you know, an elevator bank and a lobby with a million people and, uh, you know, breakfast buffets where you have hundreds of people all in one in one spot. Uh, we've never operated like that. So I think um, if you were to if you were to design a place with COVID in mind, I think it might look a little bit like Trout Point Lodge. So I think admittedly, uh, we had some very big natural advantages um, in terms of dealing with uh, with COVID. Uh, and uh, we sort of joke sometimes that we've been, you know, we've been social distancing out here for years before it was such a fashionable thing to do. Uh, so, um, uh, but other than that, you know, with um, as far as our daily operations go, uh, we follow all the sanitization and disinfecting uh, protocols that we need to do. Uh, and we've really built that into our housekeeping, um, uh, our housekeeping uh, ways of working. Uh, and we've done a few things like we've, you know, put put seals on the on the doors, uh, really done thorough disinfecting in the rooms as an additional step to, to housekeeping. Um, and we have had to uh, move around a little bit in terms of our dining rooms and our and our seating areas and things like that just to uh, to maintain social distancing. But uh, there there are a number of uh, protocols that we put in play, in, pay, in place with COVID um, that we actually think are better for guests overall. So um, you know the door seals and disinfecting, for example. Um, I I don't see why we wouldn't keep on doing that even after COVID is long behind us, just because it's an extra level of uh, uh, of uh, reassurance and uh, and uh, and um, uh, protection for our guests. Uh, and uh, and and does at least uh, it, it, not only are we doing it, but we're 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 being seen to do it as well, which is equally important. Um, so COVID has uh, has has certainly affected us. Uh, we we didn't really know uh, at the at the end at the beginning of last year uh, whether we would be able to realistically uh, keep going um, with nothing but Nova Scotian guests. Uh, we were just not sure. We've always had a number of uh, a pretty high number of Nova Scotian guests anyway, um, but uh, since the beginning of last season, we've been 99.9% .9 Nova Scotian guests, uh, many of whom uh, have come back and, uh, and and stayed with us multiple times, even in the last two years. Uh, so I, I think that in that respect, uh, we might look back in a few years and say COVID actually did have some benefits to the business as well, just in terms of the local, uh, the local, um, uh, let's say, awareness that we've been able to, uh, to, uh, to drive. Uh, so we're thrilled about that. Uh, and um, and I think there's, as I mentioned, a number of COVID things that uh, that we'd like to probably keep even after this uh, uh, all of this craziness is properly behind us. That's great to hear. That's awesome. And uh, um, what impact do you feel local entrepreneurs may have on the tourism sector in Nova Scotia? Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I think the the opportunity for uh, particularly innovation and, and different things really uh, really comes to mind. So if you think of very tiny, you know, small sort of local tourism focused entrepreneurs, uh, I'll give you one example. Um, right over close to us um, is a place called Deep Sky Eye, which is an observatory about twenty minutes away, uh, operated by a, a, a really uh, close partner of ours called Tim Doucette. Um and. Uh, Deep Sky Eye opened up probably about five six years ago um, with the with the the uh, UNESCO designation of Trout Point Lodge and the Southwest Nova Biosphere. Um, so those kinds of things. Uh, he's been doing really well in terms of, of attracting people uh, down to uh, to experience this quiet little part of the province in a way that they otherwise kind of wouldn't. So I think the I think the local uh, the local entrepreneurialism that exists in the tourism business uh, is is really something that uh, that just provides guests with a uh, with a different differentiated and unique experience you know and uh, um, I think uh, if you if you look around there are you know there are chain hotels and large large places around and they have a place in the in the ecosystem for sure um, so I wouldn't say anything uh, anything disparaging about any of that but uh, um, as we go more and more down that kind of route I think the uh, the benefit of the small sort of entrepreneurial tourism business is even uh, is even greater um, and uh, you know uh, we also uh, sort of sometimes look uh, look at what others are doing for inspiration ourselves you know there there are, there are places that focus on things like foraging, uh, and we do a little bit of that here too. But uh, I think there's always uh, there's always learnings that uh, uh, that some of these small innovative places can bring to the uh, you know bring to the party that uh, uh, that uh, 
uh, that maybe are things that we haven't thought about or things we haven't thought about in exactly the same way. And, uh, um, you know, we, we'd like to think that we're kind of humble and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, contrite enough to realize that we don't have all the answers in our own heads for sure. So sometimes this, uh, uh, this um, uh, local entrepreneurial kind of uh, uh, passion leads us to thinking in ways that we might have otherwise not entirely. So I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, it really does. Thank you. Um, and have you seen a shift in guests' attitudes to sustainability over the years? Like, has it improved at all since things have become more aware since you began in 2018? Yeah, I, I think it has, and and I don't see that going away. To be honest, you know, there are uh, there are more and more programs that, uh, uh, like Green Keys Global, for example, which is the one that we're part of, um, that uh, that provides a little bit of a let's say a scorecard for sustainability. Um, and I think as much as it may have been a an innovative, different, nice thing to to think about maybe twenty years ago, let's say, uh, more and more um, uh, hospitality businesses, and I think businesses overall um, are are putting sustainability right there in the middle of all their key metrics, uh, not as something that's, yeah, let's just do it after the fact, but something that we have to do built right in. Uh, and even the larger companies I know, you know, uh, in manufacturing or electronics or things like that, uh, uh, really care about sustainability, not only of their own operations, but of all of their subcontractors and partners and everything. So, um, so I think the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and the more that that sustainability um, awareness grows, uh, the better it is for us selfishly, uh, but the better it is for, I think, all of us, um, because it, it, uh, it moves it out of the wings and really into center stage. Uh, and we've kind of found that quite a lot of these things, um, when you look at these, uh, you know, these, these choices that we make from a sustainability perspective, um, uh, it's not a trade-off between doing the right thing from a sustainability perspective and doing the right thing from a financial perspective. Um, it's very often that the answer is one and the same for both of those things. Uh, and, um, uh, and when we when you think about it like that, um, there it's a little bit almost of a false choice to say uh, you have to choose to either be sustainable or you know something else. Or if if, uh, if financial considerations are uh, are what's holding you back, we've really found that we can uh, uh, that we can do right by the business and do right by all of our sustainability um, uh, metrics as well by by really focusing on that. So it hasn't been a trade off at all. Wonderful, great answer. Thank you, and. Um... This is a question from a student again. And uh, have uh, are, are there any opportunities for any Mount management students at Trail Point Lodge? I would say the short answer would be yes. You know, we uh, we recruit uh, pre-COVID. We recruit. Um, uh, we always have about half of our team that's uh, that's kind of local and uh, and either in the neighborhood or or from from the province. Uh, this year has been even more, and we. Uh, we uh, we love 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 uh, to make connections with uh, with talented, energetic people, uh, be they management or anything else. But uh, uh, that's a very long way to say a very short answer. But yes, <laughs> resoundingly <laughs> <Wonderful>. so. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. Um, and this is another question as well, which I'm actually kind of interested in hearing. Um, the menu at Trout Point Lodge has changed every day. And as you were saying, um, has your culinary team run out of ideas for menus? And how have you dealt with this or created more ideas and done your research? Yeah, good, good question. You know, we, um, we the way we, 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 um, communicate this to guests is that uh, whether you're here for a day or you're here for a week, you'll never eat the same thing twice. Um, so behind the door, we do have recurring menu items for sure. So we might have something that that features on there sort of four or five, six times a month kind of thing. Um, when our when our guests uh, uh, kind of change, uh, the average length of stay here is probably about three and a half days. Uh, so we, we do get some one weekers and we do get some one nighters as well. Um, but we're able to uh, we're able to kind of get around that problem because it's a, it's a very good question because after a while you'd be scratching your head going, uh, you know, what, what's, what's next to do kind of thing. Um, but there is a bit of a recurring theme that runs in the background, uh, which does allow us to get some efficiencies out of the kitchen because the, uh, the, the, the starting from scratch every day thing is, uh, uh, is a pretty tough task, especially when you're so far out of the way. Uh, so there is a little bit of built-in recurrence that goes in there. Uh, and typically, you know, from a, uh, from a culinary perspective as well, we really try, uh, we're, we run at fairly close to zero waste uh, in the, uh, in the kitchen, all of our, all of our food scraps and 
and stuff like that, we uh, we actually um, uh, give to a local farmer who's uh, who uses them for uh, for animal feed, uh, which is talk about your wonderful solution, right? You talk about a win win. Uh, they are happy with uh, with uh, with all of this uh, all of this uh, this compost going to their animals, uh, and we are supremely happy at being able to get rid of it without having to do much more, right? So we would otherwise have to. Uh, it would be a whole lot more effort. So uh, so that's just an example of kind of the zero waste philosophy, and we do have a, a number of things where um, you know we we kind of use you know the whole fish, the whole animal kind of thing in different ways. So you might uh, you might get uh, uh, you might get a large halibut and make uh, and make a number of mains out of that and use the uh, and use uh, all the rest of it for uh, you know for stocks or soups or things. So um, so we try to be creative in terms of using every every little last bit that we've got, uh, and then recurring in the background uh, is the way to get around that challenge of, uh, of having to whip up something every single day. Um, on a side question from myself, um, if you had someone who had a, a big allergy, is that something that you asked them to tell you in advance? Or um, if you're a picky eater like me who doesn't like fish or something like that, and maybe fish is the menu for the evening, what, how do you get around those type of, those type of things? That's a very good question. Yeah. So we always do have an option of protein. So we usually have a fish and a meat on the uh, on the menu at any given time. Um, we we send out a pre arrival form to all of our guests about two weeks before they they arrive. And we ask them uh, to let us know of any dietary restrictions, allergies, preferences and anything uh, like that. And, uh, and our, um, our commitment is if we know about it in advance, we can always cater to it. That includes more serious things like sea celiacs and, uh, uh, and, uh, and let's say, uh, you know, uh, more life threatening allergies. Uh, so if we know about it in advance, we can certainly cater to it. And it's something that we uh, not only not only that we do, but we take a lot of pride in doing because we don't think if you're vegetarian, you should be getting the short end of the stick and having a, a meal that's, uh, that's not of the same quality as, as anybody else. So, uh, so yes, we do it. Uh, we, we do ask for advance notice so that we can be well prepared for your arrival. Um, and uh, we're pretty happy with, uh, with, uh, with, um, you know, community communicating that to guests and saying, uh, if you're vegetarian or vegan or pescatarian or whatever, you're not going to get a, uh, uh, you know, it won't be an afterthought. You'll, you'll get, uh, you'll get as high a quality meal here as, as, uh, as would, uh, as would anybody else. As a vegetarian. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice to hear. Oh, um, okay. So we do have some questions from emails as well. So I'll, I'll head to those ones. Um, uh, what is your average frequent guest ratio? You mean oh, in terms of repeat like, guests and yes, I think that's that's what that was meant to be. Yeah. So <laughs> we we are actually close to about 40% repeat guests uh, for this year. Uh, it's a number we track quite closely. Um, and uh, and we're pretty happy with the way that's grown. And I think it, it may be slightly skewed because I know there are uh, of course the last two years we've been uh, we've been um, welcoming all Nova Scotian guests. Uh, and many of those have come back two or three times in the uh, in the season, which we're thrilled about. But I think uh, uh, I think a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, when when the borders truly do open again, I imagine there will be a number of people in province that are itching to get out. Uh, so I think that 40% number might be might be telling us something a little bit you know, we're probably not quite that good just yet. I think the uh, I think the number would go down, um, but uh, it is rising very, uh, very, um, uh, very uh, uh, in a positive way. Uh, and uh, and our repeat guests are are obviously not just not just valuable in and of themselves, but uh, in the Nova Scotia context, where we're a pretty small province and community to begin with, um, word of mouth is uh, is really just driving a whole lot of uh, of, uh, of good sales uh, uh, and good uh, and good new guests for us as well. So it's it's at forty percent. Uh, I expect that number will go down next year when, you know, or whenever COVID, uh, whenever COVID, you know, sort of is really behind us. Um, but even if it does go down, it'll, it'll end up at a higher point than when it was that in what it was when COVID started. So, um, and uh, if we don't do right by our repeat guests, then, uh, then shame on us, right? That's a, that's a, that's a super important piece of what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you get a lot of repeat guests or, I mean, before COVID, did you get a lot of repeat guests who were international? people coming from out of America or Europe or elsewhere? Yeah, we, we did, you know, we get to, uh, before before the COVID world, in, in very broad numbers, we were about 50% Canadian, including Nova Scotian, uh, about 30% American, and about 20% everything else, a lot of Europeans, but also, you know, all over the world. Um, so we, we do have a very, uh, a very um, devout uh, sort of a, a group of repeat guests who've been, uh, who've been shut out for the last couple of years because of border restrictions, uh, many of whom are coming, I think we have a couple coming this, this, uh, uh, this week for the for the first time in three years. Um, so uh, yeah, we're always, uh, we're always trying to extend that 
that as well. Uh, and uh, we do have a pretty a pretty loyal following of people from outside the province as well, who I'm sure we'll be seeing, you know, whenever circumstances permit. And uh, I, I, this is a, a bit repetitive, but um, maybe you could go in a little bit more detail on this. But one of the questions was, is being sustainable contributing positively or making it more difficult to retain returning guests? Uh, I think overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and uh, we, we, try to, we try to be very clear with what guests uh, should expect or can expect when they come here. So I, 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 we, uh, we never like uncertainty or ambiguity, right? So on our website, we try to be very, uh, very open and clear about what, uh, what they'll find when they get here, uh, what they will find and what they won't find. Uh, and I think the sustainability angle um, really does help us um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of recruiting not only, not only guests, but also guests that kind of, let's say, resonate and appreciate you know, resonate with and appreciate the offering that we have. Uh, and, uh, and I think when you get that fit well, well, um, uh, you know, well executed, then it, uh, then it leads to very good outcomes. So uh, I think the, uh, the answer is that all of these sustainability things are, are so baked into what we do that it's, uh, it's almost impossible to separate that from, from the lodge itself, really, we'd like to think. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. And, uh, is your hotel totally local cuisine? And I think you already answered that question for us, but um, how do you make sure that there are, that there is enough supply for students, for customers to, to show up? Like, have you ever run out of anything? that you needed and you had um, to go? Yeah, we, we have. Um, I mean, I won't say it's never, um, but it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a huge challenge and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that we really can't get wrong. So we spend more time and probably more money uh, on our supply chain than, uh, than most places of a similar size would do. Uh, so it's really a question of um, uh, trying to, uh, to make sure not only that we have the right partners, but the right logistics are in place as well, um, and uh, we we do we do spend a lot of time going to them rather than them coming to us, which is certainly you know extra effort and cost. Um, we do run out of stuff, but we've got pretty good storage uh, you know behind the door kind of thing in the kitchen and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, being a being a relatively small size, we have uh, we have pretty good um, we have pretty good line of sight of our bookings and our uh, our reservations. Um, being only thirteen rooms, we have a very very long booking window, so most our, our typical guest books with us about six months before they arrive. Uh, so uh, we do, we do, of course, we do get cancellations from time to time, but very, very few. Um, and that visibility helps helps us to plan. So we know with quite a degree of confidence how many guests we're likely to have on, you know, on any given day or week kind of thing. Um, last minute bookings are not not never, but pretty rare, uh, just because, you know, you've got to make an effort to get here and it's out of the way and we don't get any walk-ups or any drive-throughs, right, um, in that respect. Um, so that makes the procurement side of things a little bit easier. Um, and then uh, and then we try, we've, we've vastly increased our storage because it's not only, of course, the, the culinary side of things, but everything else as well, uh, that, uh, you know, if we run out of beer here, God help us all, right? So we're trying really hard not to do that. Um, but um, uh, it just requires a lot of good planning and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, uh, uh, effort and attention. And I think the, uh, uh, the expense of running our supply chain here is quite significantly higher than it would be in, let's say, an urban setting when, when you have, you know, much more choices and, uh, and economies of scale that we don't really have here. So it is a challenge, but uh, uh, we spend a lot of time on making sure we get it right. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, this is another question from a student. How do you define luxury with nature? Um, how do you know that no TV or phone is the best way? And because these are uh, because I suppose some people consider this as ne necessary um, things for life. Some people might not think that a lack of technology is, is not luxury. Have, have you ever found that or come across uh, some customers who were surprised by that or what has your marketing and uh, your uh, communication via your website been like a, a good buffer for that? Um, that's a great question, uh, and uh, we we do try to we do try to be as as upfront 
transparent and uh, and communicative as possible. So on our website, um, you know, in the booking path, um, you you won't be able to get to the to to make a booking uh, without at least being aware of the uh, of the things that we have and that we don't have. Uh, and I'll give you another example, like uh, you know, there, there's the luxury side with TVs and and things like that. Um, uh, cell phone service is another one. So we don't have cell phone service here. We're outside of the cell phone network, which um, which probably 95% of our guests uh, consider to be a positive thing. Um, but we want everybody to know about that before they come, right? Uh, and um, and we're very kind of loud and proud about saying, uh, you know, this this is what uh, this is what there is when you come to Trout Point Lodge, and this is what there isn't. Um, uh, and you know, with without this sounding in any way arrogant, because we don't mean it as arrogance at all. But without without this sounding that way, um, if if TVs and iPads and uh, and a business center and and all that are uh, are what you're looking for in a vacation. Um, we're just not the right place. Um, and that's perfectly okay, I think, for us to be very, very upfront to say, uh, we would rather, um, for all kinds of reasons, we would rather that um, that guests know exactly what they're getting when they're here and what we offer resonates with them. And if it doesn't resonate with them, um, then, you know, this is probably not the place uh, that you're looking for. Um, and uh, we we try to say that in a uh, in in this polite phrase and, and way that we possibly can because there's a lot that we that we can offer here, um, but uh, we don't want uh, we don't want guests to expect those kinds of things, um, and they can certainly find them elsewhere. So we're not the only luxury show in town by any stretch for sure, uh, and across the product spectrum of uh, of everything from really small places to huge resorts, uh, we fit in where we where we want to be, uh, and we want to make sure that we that we attract the guests that fit in where they want to be as well, if that makes sense. Wonderful, thank you. And what are some challenges that um, the lodge will faces in the winter, like maybe in regards to like your food or um, the type of menus you have to offer, or also with like uh, customers showing up when it's uh, colder seasons, things like that. Yeah, well, we're um, we're hard at work to um, uh, to get our winter season ready for this year for the first time ever. So we'll uh, uh, we're doing a whole bunch of work at the end of October to prepare for uh, for November and onwards. Um, we will. Um, uh, we are going to double our maintenance team um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of looking after all of our grounds and everything like that. In the summer, it's quite easy, but in the winter, of course, you need to keep the roads plowed and you need to keep the uh, uh, the walkways uh, free of snow and ice and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot more that we need to do. Um, and then the you know the uh, the programming and the uh, and the outdoor natural experiences will change a little bit. Uh, so we will uh, we will probably do a little bit more indoors than outdoors. We'll have uh, uh, we'll have some different um, uh, different outdoor activities on offer that are more winter friendly let's say um, and uh, of course the hot tub and the sauna will be even better in the winter than they are in the summer in my in my opinion so it'll be a different experience um, but one that still has kind of the trout point flavor to it um, I think from a menu perspective we uh, there there will be a few challenges for sure in terms of fresh ingredients and things but stuff that we can uh, that we can um, you know we'll sort of tailor our menu to uh, to what's available and uh, to the winter uh, you know sort of the, the the winter season I suppose uh, just like many places do so we've already started thinking about what that'll look like and uh, and what that'll mean for our for our partners here too and uh, we have time for maybe one more question so i will ask uh, i will ask one in regards to a customer experience and uh, what it was like um, in your first period of of opening or, or taking on the the trout point lodge um, what did what did you do for advertising and in and that i believe that question has to do with um, considering you had you ha only have 13 rooms available, um, focusing on customer service, it was there anything in particular that you did to try and get more customers, or did you have a lot of retention from the former owners? Uh, yeah, good, good question for sure. When we um, when we took over four years ago, in, in our in our very first year, we were we were quite determined not to change too much because uh, um, you know we we uh, Pam and I I think we needed to get our feet planted and really understand uh, you know the the uh, uh, how the business runs and uh, who was in our team and the, the team members and everything. So we we were very vocal and loud and uh, and very explicit with our whole team to say we're not here to uh, we're not here to change the world. And uh, you know I can't think of a faster way to alienate. People people than to walk in and say, hi, I'm Patrick, I know better than you. Um, you know, uh, that's not, uh, that's not, uh, 
in, in my experience in life, that has never been an effective solution or an effective strategy. Um, so we 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 um, we listened a lot and didn't change very much in the uh, in the early stages, um, and found that um, that with time we we have done a little bit of everything. So we've done paid advertisements in lots of different magazines and spent a lot of money. Uh, and to be honest, it did nothing at all. Uh, and I think uh, I think the reason for that, and I don't know if this probably doesn't apply uh, widely, but it certainly applies to us is, um, you know, the essence of Trout Point Lodge can't really be captured in a half page ad, right? Um, and of course, advertisement, um, me talking about Trout Point Lodge, um, my inherent bias shows through for sure. Uh, so uh, we're always, uh, we're always kind of conscious of that, that uh, I'm not the best spokesman for Trout Point Lodge, because I'm so ridiculously biased about this place that, uh, um, that I don't have much credibility at all you know with the outside world uh, and fair enough um, so what we've done um, we we started very early uh, with social media so um, uh, my wife Pam is uh, among many of her other talents she is a uh, she really is a social media genius uh, and we have built up our Instagram from zero uh, to about twelve and a half thousand followers in uh, in um, you know the, the space of about three and a half years uh, we didn't buy a single click so if you want followers you can pay some money and get some if you like uh, we didn't buy a single click and even more importantly important than the number of our followers is the engagement. Uh, so our, our engagement has been really, really excellent. Uh, and, uh, and social media has, uh, has, has given us an opportunity to kind of tell our story, particularly on Instagram. Um, where you know here's here's a, a little bit of what the experience will look like in a way that that really fosters that kind of interaction with our uh, with our followers as well um and the second thing and this is one that uh, that uh, uh takes a long time to get running is uh we have been hugely successful and pleased with uh with the editorial coverage that we've got here so we had uh we had a um a journalist from Forbes magazine come here a couple of years ago and write up an article uh uh you know sort of a three four page article about the experience at Trout Point Lodge. And when that when that comes from somebody else, there is so much more credibility than when it comes from me or, or Pam or anybody in the team. So um, editorial coverage, we, we were one of uh, one of 10 places across the country in 2020 uh, to be featured in uh, in the Globe and Mail uh, Hidden Canada, uh, which is something that comes out every single year uh, and focuses on some of these kind of, you know, slightly lesser known spots across the country. Uh, and we found that social media and, and editorial coverage um, is is wonderful. Uh, and we want to do as much of that as we possibly can. Uh, and we found paid advertisements, you could drop, uh, you know, you drop 10,000 bucks to be an on route magazine for uh, for a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, because of our small size, I think the question had that uh, had that in it too. Uh, because of our small size, the ROI, the return on investment just never works. Uh, so um, you, you you won't get enough bookings out of that um, with a denominator of 13 rooms uh, to make it make sense at all. So it's, it's been social media and editorial that we found really does move the needle pretty well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think I actually, I read that, was that the Globe and Mail uh, editorial on it? And that's how I learned about the Trail Point Lodge. So yeah, oh, music to my ears, Caitlin. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, I believe we have run out of time, but um, thank you so much for, for answering all of our questions and for giving us all of your, um, your knowledge and uh, for uh, really giving us so much information about Trout Point Lodge. It was, it was really, really wonderful to hear about your passion and everything. And it's very obvious how much you love this place. So yes, thank you again for being here. And on behalf of all the students, just a, a big resounding thank you for, for giving us this, this time and um, explaining to us your sustainability practices. Well, well, thank you as well. And, uh, and thanks for everybody who spent some time here. And if there are other questions uh, uh, afterwards, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And uh, uh, thanks to you, Caitlin, and also to you, Maria. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, spend a bit of time together today. So thank you. Thank you both for that. Thank you. All right. Well, have a good day, everyone. And uh, have a good day, Patrick. And uh, Patrick was saying, if anyone does feel like stinking around and asking questions, um, you're perfectly welcome to. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Patrick. You were absolutely wonderful. And on behalf of the students and um, faculty here, we really appreciate your time. Um, a busy, busy day for you, seeing as you're fully booked still, which is really great to hear uh, with COVID happening. So I look forward to touching base with you afterwards, but thank you for your time. Thank you too, Maria.